Tell me when to start. Welcome, everybody, to our session with Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld. Perfectly Imperfect is the name of today's class and session. And Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld is a practicing psychotherapist currently working in the addiction field focusing on the interface between philosophy, spirituality, and psychology. He is currently working on a monograph entitled Fragmented Origins, the Kabbalistic Thought of Rabbi Shlomo Eliashev. Uh, I know you're working on, it might be further along in that project uh, as well. And through video classes and his podcast, Inward, Rabbi Joey guides us through the world and major works of Kabbalah, Hasidic masters, Jewish and Jewish philosophy, shedding light on the inner life of the soul. And I can tell you all from experience that Rav Joey is, I would say, one of the clearest expositors of Jewish mysticism in English um, in our world today, I really believe. And uh, it's really a, a source and an honor to have you uh, share your insights with us today, Rav Joey. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Rav Daniel. Everybody could hear me clear enough? Yeah, okay, wonderful. So it's a real um, honor to be part of the Divine News Seminar. Anything that Rav Daniel is doing is good for the Jewish people. And anything that's good for the Jewish people is good for the world. And um, there are times in history where we sometimes fall into a certain unconsciousness where we forget that the world is profoundly broken. And what that's part of what we're going to talk about today. But then there's also times and periods of history where it's abundantly clear how broken things are. And um, our sages have taught us that ultimately one can look at the brokenness and mourn it, or one can look at the brokenness and, and understand what it's trying to teach us on a spiritual level about ourselves, about our relationship with Hashem, about our relationship with other people, and ultimately about our relationship with ourselves, which like we've spoken about, I'm sure, throughout the courses today, that when a person comes in contact with themselves on the deepest level, they're also in encountering their higher power. They're encountering their divine spark that animates the self, that animates the emotions. Very few teachers have expressed that notion as clearly as Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. On a certain level, in my humble bias, you know, Rabbi Nachman is, is all of our teachers in this generation, whether or not we know it or not. He's the one who teaches us that there's no such thing as giving up hope. But, but Rabbi Nachman has an incredible teaching based on the, the Pasuk in Tehillim when David HaMelech says that my, my heart says to me, my heart says to you, I will seek your face. And Rashi and Rabbi Nachman commenting on this, this notion says that the emotions of the heart themselves, the pulsations of the emotional experience, that, that still small voice that speaks within the cavern of our self, is in fact a simon from Hashem. Hashem sends those heart murmurings into us to awaken us to say, reach out to me, reach out to me. And when we're able to listen and attune ourselves to that sound, to that voice, then we're able to just slightly turn ourselves in the right direction, which is ultimately all we can try and do in, um, in this world. Now, Perfectly Imperfect is, is, in truth, one of my favorite topics. And what we're going to try and do tonight is a scattering um, from different places and more of a general overview, if you will, of the concept. Now, we can find it in the Gemara. We can find it in conceptions of halacha or law. We can find it in Jewish mysticism. As we'll see, we can find it in chassidut. We can find it in postmodernism and music and the Grateful Dead. A person can find it in any avenue that they so choose to look upon. But what I want to kind of bring up before we descend down this path into the imperfection of the soul is the issue that so many of us live with. Now, as human beings, we're products of, of many interacting systems. And the myth that many of us have learned as, as young children of this notion of a tabula rasa, of a clean slate, as if a human being operates in a, a petri dish away from any external influences, is at, at best a misnomer, at worst, a, a tragic narrative that we tell ourselves. But we, we are products of microsystems, of macrosystems. We're affected by our families of origin, by the communities of origin, by the state that we live in, by the country that we live in, and the zeitgeist that 
creates kind of the spiritual, social, political, all, all of the different elements that create the environment that we live within. And one of the notions that we've kind of been forced to swallow for a long time is that the path of human experience is the attempt to reach perfection, is the attempt to find that place where a person can finally close their eyes and say, I have reached the goal, I have arrived at the destination, I have accomplished everything that I've hoped to accomplish, there is nothing missing, there is nothing lacking, there is nothing absent from my life, and I have everything, I have multitudes within me, as Walt Whitman would say. And the problem with this is twofold. The problem with this is perfection is not a possibility for anybody, even if that were what we were supposed to be reaching towards. But even more so that this false notion is, is expressed through the mouths of the Torah and through the mouths of religion and spirituality. That we're taught that the quest of spirituality, the rungs of the spiritual ladder are meant to bring us to a place of wholeness, to a place of spiritual bliss in this world, to a place of nirvana, to a place of self-transcendence, to an annihilation of the self, any of the synonyms that have been used throughout history. But the basic notion is that perfection is a possibility and you should reach to it. What that does for us is when we find ourselves stuck within the mires of imperfection, not only do we suffer what it means to be imperfect, but in a classical sense of adding insult onto injury, we feel that we're the ones to blame for being imperfect. Because if perfection is a possibility, then it is my job to reach perfection. And if I can't become perfect, then I can't reach that point of perfection. Well, then it is my fault. I lay the blame at the feet of my own self. And they have a wonderful saying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that says, pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. That when a person ultimately feels that they are the ones to blame for the deficiencies in their lives, rather than a movement towards repentance or a movement inwards or forwards, what it typically does is it creates a, an environment or an arena of self-loathing, of self-judgment, of looking at the self and saying, I'm broken, I'm deficient, I'm not good enough. That drives us to a sense of, if only I had this, that, or the other thing to fill that void within me, then I would be satisfied. And we chase after all of these fantastical solutions only to find that we're left craving even when we reach the destination, and then we say to ourselves, oh, I must not have really found the right destination. I have to go further and further and further until after 120 years, a person is on their deathbed and they realize just with a glimpse of an insight that, you know, I, I have wasted my life. I have been chasing this fantastical, imaginative goal, this destination of perfection, when in truth, it was never a possibility. We need to be able to fight through this pathological description of ourselves, which we have all embodied on a certain level. When I feel that I'm not being successful at work, what that does is it impinges on my sense of self, on my sense of value, being that the first question many people ask is what do you do? What do you produce? What are you capable of making? What are you capable of offering somebody else? On a certain level, this is just a byproduct of late capitalism, which sees human beings as engines of potential production value. And when a person is not producing something as they should be, theoretically, they're seen as being deficient. It affects our interpersonal relationships. It affects our relationship with our bodies. It affects our relationship with likely what you, many of you have learned about all day, the enterprise of mindfulness, meditation, cultivation of self-transcendence. Very often the clients that I work with, when I talk about mindfulness, when I hint to the notion of mindfulness as a remedy to addictions of any sort, whether it's a substance abuse addiction or addiction to type of thinking. So their immediate question is typically, okay, now that I'm going to do this for 24 hours a day, how in the world am I going to get work done? And I always like to say, slow down, brother. You know, the goal here is not perfection. We're talking 10 minutes a day. If you could do 10 minutes a day, then that's a win. And that's enough to teach you that you can do more than 10 minutes a day. But we're so hardwired to think it's all or nothing that we live lives of quiet and often loud desperation because we haven't reached that 
proverbial perfection. And we also dispel or, or negate the possibility of joy. Because if I convince myself that joy is only going to be found at the end of the journey, very often what happens is when I reach that end of the journey, I'm, I'm more dissatisfied than I ever was. In Greek, there's, um, there's two words that represents desire. And those who understand this emotion will understand exactly what this means. There's the desire for an object prior to having it, meaning the yearning towards something that we feel will fill us. And then there's a more insidious, almost existential desire that we experience when we have the thing that we've been craving for so long. That we convince ourselves in our own personal narratives that if only I have this, that, or the other thing, if only this, that, or the other thing was taken out of my life, then everything would be okay. I would reach that island of serenity. And then we come to find that when all of those impediments are cleared out of our heads, we're left with the biggest impediment of all, which is ourselves, our own hearts, our own minds. And so the goal, I believe, of Kabbalah, the goal, I believe, of Panimiya Satora, the inner teachings of Torah, what the lifeblood, the pulsating light that rests at the very core of what we are as, as a nation, as a religion, as a spiritual path, as a, a process of human experience, as a light unto the nations to teach the world a certain way of living. I believe that the therapeutic goal at the core of the Torah is to teach us not only that perfection is not a possibility and that it's an empty word, a meaningless word, a word that has been co-opted by other religions, by other spiritual paths, which is somewhat of a, a form of foreign worship, but rather to also teach us that not only is perfection not a possibility, but the goal is to accept our very imperfection. And that when a person learns to accept their very real and, and essential point of lack within themselves, the point of deficiency within themselves, that's where we come closest to contact with notions of self-nullification, of getting out of my own way, and potentially opening myself up to the only true perfection in the world, which is, which is God, which is the light of the infinite or whatever word a person wants to use to describe that ineffable, ungraspable reality of God, which is so big and so ever-present that words fail in trying to describe it. Now, first off, we can look towards the very beginning, right? Very often, a certain Western narrative of the story of the Genesis, of Beratius, of Misa Beratius, is that God creates a world, a perfect world, and Adam and Chava, who were perfect people, were meant to keep the world in its state of perfection. And Adam and Chava, in that his, history-making event, forced the world back into imperfection and were cast out of Gan Eden, were cast out of that utopian space where things were good and okay. And our job is to return back there, to find ourselves back in the space of perfection. And anytime we don't, and anytime we can't reach there, it's our fault. We lay the blame at our own feet. We judge ourselves unfavorably. We become resentful towards ourselves, towards other people, towards the world, and most importantly, to the concept of God. Because we say to God, you know, you've demanded too much of me. You've demanded perfection. I didn't do this. I didn't break things in the beginning. Why should I be damned to wander this wandering, winding road of being stuck in imperfection and lack? That's a cursory reading of certain Western conceptions, other religious ways of looking at the narrative of Gan Eden, that we were perfect, we became imperfect, imperfection is our own fault, and our job is to come back to perfection. Judaism has a very, very different way of looking at things. When we look at what Adam and Chava's role was when they were placed in the Garden of Eden at the outset of creation, even in a prelapsarian stage, even prior to that cataclysmic breakdown of all things. What the Pasuk says, what the Torah says, is that Adam and Chava were placed in the garden, la'avda ulashamra, to guard it and to cultivate it. Now those words, to guard it and to cultivate it, are very important to our narrative, because if I'm a perfect being operating in a space of perfection, then I don't need to be warned to guard myself against anything. The sense of setting up a guard is the implication that there's a threat, some sort of external threat that can impinge upon my well-being. But if I'm perfect, 
then there's no need for me to be afraid because there's not going to be any entry point for that possibility of failure. And cultivation or planting, that's not present in a space of perfection. If everything is created as it should be, if everything operates in its unified, perfect way, then there's no need for me to put in toil. There's no need for me to utilize the strength of my hands and the strength of my human capacity and functioning to, to cultivate the garden. So what our sages tell us and what our Kabbalists tell us and what our tzaddikim tell us and what our poets and our philosophers tell us is that at the very outset of creation, we were not perfect. We were never meant to be perfect. We were, meant to, we were never meant to assume that we were perfect. Human beings were always already susceptible to deficiency. Why? Because we're not God. Anything other than God is imperfect by definition. And in fact, any assumption that one can reach perfection is an arrogant claim that one can be on the same functioning level as God, something tantamount to the greatest level of heresy imaginable in our tradition. The very context of what it means to be a human being is to always already be born in a natural state of imperfection. But what we see is that this imperfection that we carry within us is not the result of some failure. It's not some pathological symptom that takes place when I screw things up or when I mess up, but rather it is the very constitutive fabric that makes me a human being. I lack, therefore I am. Because I am a human being, there is a deficiency within me. Because there is a deficiency within me, I yearn towards some sort of fullness that is outside of me. That natural craving of the spirit for something greater than itself. What it is, we all have infinitely different words to use to describe it, but that very natural craving is what gives birth to the recognition that there is something perfect. Because if everything was imperfect, I wouldn't yearn for perfection. If God was imperfect, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have this craving to reach beyond myself. So the very natural experience of what it means to be a human being, to desire something, to want some sort of fullness, to crave something, that points very clearly and without a shadow of a doubt that human beings are meant to be imperfect. We're not meant to be perfect. We're meant to learn how to live with our imperfections. On a certain level, the best metaphor for this can be music. When Chazal want to describe the joy, when the rabbis wanted to describe the musical joy, that, and I believe that music comes after this, so this might be a meditation to hold in mind when music is being played, that when the rabbis wanted to describe the greatest kind of profundity of joy, imaginable, they spoke about the Simchat Beit HaShoeva, the joy and the celebration of drawing the waters from the abysmal depths and drawing those waters as a water libation in the times of the temple on the second night of the holiday of Sukkot. And the Gemara in the last parak of the tractate of Sukkah has remarkable descriptions of this almost carnivalistic scene with rabbis of, of report kind of dancing and doing handstands and, and, and the women partaking and the men partaking and all sorts of happiness and joy and self-abandonment. That the, the title for that chapter is called Ha-Khalil. Ha-Khalil means a flute. So on a certain level, the greatest depiction of the greatest imaginable joy is rooted in music. And the example that the rabbis choose to use for that description of music is a flute. Now our sages tell us as follows, a flute is an empty vessel, similar to a guitar. And it's specifically that emptiness through which the air blows that creates the sound of music. If the flute were filled with itself, there would be no room to allow that exhalation of the self to move through those empty spaces to create different tunes and different notions of musical excitement. And when a person looks at an air instrument itself, what it is is basically moving your fingers along different vacant spaces, learning how to wander the territory of lack and deficiency. And that very experience of playing with the lack in our lives is what gives birth to our personal song. That is why the word Khalil or flute in the sacred tongue is the same etymological root and the same letters as halal, as a void, as a vacant space. 
because the vacant spaces in our lives are the specific tapestries where we're meant to paint our personal picture. Our tzaddikim very remarkably tell us that you are not identified by your particular strength. We all have strengths. We all have things that we're good at. We all have things that we feel self-sufficient in, where we feel good about ourselves and we feel confident. And those are very important in our lives. A person needs to feel confident. Without confidence or self-acceptance, a person can't function. A person is a slave to everybody else and their lives are an up and down on a roller coaster, depending on the type of facial expression somebody gives to me. We all have to learn how to cultivate a sense of self-acceptance and a recognition of our strengths. But that is not where the identifying factor of being human comes from. Our sages teach us that if you want to understand the thing that makes me me, it's my own particular lack. The area in my life where I feel my deficiency. The area in my life where I feel forced into myself to move inwards, to collapse inwards. And where no matter how much effort I put in, no matter how good I try and make my life, nevertheless, there's always this thirst. There's always this residual hunger, a craving. But it's not a hunger for food or for water. Because I just ate, and I just drank, and I have the nice house, and I have the nice car, and I have the degrees, and I have the money, and I have whatever it is that I want. There's a hunger that persists. There's a hunger that resists all attempts at satisfaction. And that's the hunger of the soul. That's the broken space in the soul which gives birth to yearning towards God. Yearning as a spiritual ideal needs to be understood properly. We don't yearn for the sake of satisfying our yearning. We yearn because the spiritual value of yearning and desire is one of the loftiest things that an individual can do. The fact that I yearn, the fact that I know that something is missing in my life always perpetually driving me to acknowledge the fact that I am human, propelling me towards self-acceptance as opposed to self-aggrandizement or what our rabbis have referred to as this almost self-solipsistic notion of Anna Emloch, I am the ruler, I am in charge. That is the birthplace of true Avodah Hashem. That is the birthplace of when a person can take a deep breath and say, I am imperfect and that's okay. I am perfectly imperfect on a certain level, that my imperfections are the very thing that offers me the possibility of accepting myself fully. And when I accept myself fully with all of the darkness and all of the difficulties, it's specifically there where I come to play my own song. Now, this doesn't mean, obviously, that we rest on our laurels and we tolerate discomfort. In meetings, in AA meetings, they very often utilize something that's referred to as a prayer, and it's part of an, an older text that's referred to the serenity prayer. And the serenity prayer goes as follows. And Rav Cook has a very, very similar take on this, and we'll go to that in a second. The serenity prayer goes as follows. We say, God, or higher power, my concept of the infinite, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, self-acceptance is wonderful, and it's of utmost importance in the realm of the things that we cannot change who we are, how our lives have gone, that homesickness that we have even when we're at home, that longing that is so emblemic of the Jewish spirit. In those places, we have to recognize that Hashem, God, I, I can't do more than this. I can't do more than be human. And ultimately, being human becomes the site of encountering God. But in the realm of things that we can change, I'm in a bad relationship, an unhealthy relationship, if I'm in a job that's dead end and it makes me miserable, it's inappropriate for a person to say, let me simply find my serenity here. Because the Jewish people and human beings are, are tasked with a very burdensome gift that God kind of never really asked if we wanted, and that's called free will, or bechira, or the ability to change the course of our lives. So this self-nullification, this acceptance of our deficiencies needs to be hand in hand with the recognition that I also need to propel myself forwards at every moment. The only difference is when I propel myself forward and I reach everybody sitting in a room right now and they could look up and they'll see a ceiling. And from where you're sitting, that ceiling is the loftiest place in the room. But what the notion of lack and imperfection teaches us is that when I reach the ceiling, it's simply the floor of a higher level. 
that just as God is infinite, the spiritual quest is infinite. And there's never a time where a person can say, I have reached perfection. It's when a person acknowledges that, that we're able to live with our imperfection and say, Hashem, I'm, I'm mamish imperfect, I'm, I'm, I'm broken, but that's okay because that's how you made me. And that's how you made me. Rav Cook has a different, uh, a, a different usage or very similar to this notion of the, um, of the serenity prayer. Instead of grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, Rav Cook's language is grant me the strength to fix the things that I can fix and the serenity to accept the things that I cannot fix. Because on a certain level, the goal of mindfulness, the goal of self-acceptance is always to fix things. The Jewish world believes in fixing. Now, everything is being fixed perpetually. Whether we're with it or not, everything is elevating. Everything is constantly evolving upwards towards the ultimate unity that will be revealed beyond any capacity of human cognition or thought. How it will be revealed, we have no idea. According to our own calculations, things get worse and worse and worse. But thankfully, our tzaddikim, our sages have already told us that your calculations are meaningless when it comes to God. Stop trying to think that we know what's going to happen. Things are always perpetually evolving, elevating, getting better and better and better and clearer and closer to the end goal. And sometimes it gets more painful, but it's not about trying to be perfect. It's about accepting the very fact that we are imperfect. There's a beautiful blessing that a person says that our sages to say after engaging in bodily needs, so going to the bathroom after kind of engaging with the the very real, almost irreducible physiological element of what it means to be human. A person can meditate, a person can contemplate, a person can pray, a person can uncover the spark of divinity that lives within them, they can dwell in that place, they can manifest, they could do all of the things possible, but they'll still have to go to the bathroom. The opposite was Paro. Paro hid going to the bathroom. Paro said, I don't have to go to the bathroom because I'm God. But human beings, that's what we do. And there's a bracha that we say, Asher Yatsar, where we thank God for creating us and the wonders of the body and the wondrous capacity for spirituality to manifest itself within the mundane physicality and the remarkable power of mundane physicality to reveal the depths of spirituality. And there's a line in that blessing that we say, Nekavim, Nekavim, Chalulim, Chalulim. God, you have created within me Nekavim, Nekavim, orifices, and chalalim, chalalim, and voids. So the Baal HaSulam, one of the, the biggest Kabbalistic thinkers of the last 100 years, asks the question of what the difference is between these two elements. What's the difference between nekavim, nekavim, orifices, and chalalim, or voided spaces? And the Baal HaSulam says as follows, that we all have nekavim in our lives. We all have things that were whole, things that were filled in, and somehow, some way, life has emptied them out. And we feel the pain of those things being emptied out. We feel the absence of what was previously there. And our goal is to fill those spaces again, to try as hard as we can to find content again, to find wholeness, to find fullness in our lives, and to crave and to yearn towards, towards manifesting. But then there's chalalim, then there's the voids in our lives. And these are the inherent lacks which we're born with. These are the natural deficiencies that cannot be filled. This is who we are. This is the constitutive element of our own subjective experience. And the goal with those is not to try and fill them, not to try and fight them or ignore them, but rather to allow them to become the very site of engaging with God, the very site of encountering God, not in spite of my deficiencies, but in and through my deficiencies. There's an incredible statement in the Gemara, really, that someone who is intoxicated is incapable of prayer. And again, intoxication doesn't mean intoxication. Intoxication means anybody who is utilizing some sort of substance in their lives, whether it is a physical substance, whether it's an idea, whether it's a concept, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a dream, whatever it is that we abuse. My bias is that we all live within the spectrum of the potential towards addiction. Working in the field of addiction for so long, or six years, not so long, it used to be that when a client would come into my office, my first question was, where's the trauma, right? Freud, 
the great architect of, of psychoanalysis, the Jewish science, so to speak, as our enemies called it, right? Freud said that his job was to be an archaeologist, to dig deep into the recesses of the unconscious to find the hidden bodies. And it used to be, what was the trauma? You know, what led you to feel that you needed this depth of a substance to satisfy the emptiness in your life? And now that I'm six years into the job, I don't have to ask the question anymore. If they're breathing and they're walking, that's enough of a reason for them to be addicted to a substance. Being human is hard. Being human is a difficult thing. It was not meant to be easy. If it was meant to be easy, it would be easy. Hashem created the world this way. Hashem wants our effort, wants our work, wants us to confront our deficiencies and not to give up, but rather to fight through them and to find God in spite of the darkness. Because when we find God in the darkness itself, what we're doing is revealing Hashem, not only in wholeness, which is a given, but we're revealing the power of Hashem even in brokenness, which is much more remarkable. Another Jewish poet, prophet, Kohen, right? We learned, uh, we learned in this week's Parsha, the Birchas Kohanim, the, the blessing of the priests. And there's a very beautiful video of this, uh, this post-religious, secular, profane prophet of the Jewish people kind of giving a, a Birchas Kohanim at one of his concerts. His name was Leonard Cohen. Now, Leonard Cohen has a song called Anthem. It's a very beautiful song. And in the song called Anthem, Leonard Cohen says as follows. A person needs to forget their perfect offering. There is a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. What we have to do is we have to learn how to forget this notion of perfection. Forget about offering something perfect to Hashem. Chazal say Hashem doesn't want perfection. Hashem wants broken vessels. Hashem wants real people. Hashem wants a person who's cut through with the anxiety of what it means to be human. Again, something we all experience, whether we're diagnosed with it or not. Diagnosis of anxiety is a question of quantity, not quality. We all have anxiety. We don't all have the volume that deafens us. But we all know what it means to worry and be afraid and not know and to confront our own most limitations. And we have to forget our perfect offering, recognize that there's a crack in everything. And not only is there a crack in everything, but that's how the light comes in. That's how beauty is made. That's how the music is made. That's how we paint our own lives. We just had this with the Torah. The angels are, said to God, why are you giving this to them? They fail, they die, they struggle, they lie, they're broken. And Hashem says to Moshe, that's exactly what you should answer them back. So Moshe says to the angels, do you die? Do you struggle? Do you experience difficulty? Are you in pain? If you're not, then what do you need the Torah for? You don't have the right to the Torah. There is nothing more powerful than a human being accepting themselves and saying, Hashem, this is the vessel you've made me, and this is where I'm going to come to serve you. This is the temple that I'm going to bring. As deficient as it is, as broken as it is, as ugly as it is, as, as inauthentic as it is, that's okay. You made it hard enough, Hashem, right? We don't have to worry so much sometimes about, you know, What's going to be after 120? Sometimes religion and spirituality have to answer the question of how do I live life in this world? It's not so much the question of what happens afterwards. What happens afterwards will happen afterwards. All we know is that Hashem is good and Hashem will always be good and everything is good and everything is perfect from the perspective of Hashem. We don't have to worry so much. The goal of spirituality is to say, how do I live with my lack? How do I live? How do I serve God as a human being? And this becomes almost the bedrock. And again, this is like we said, this is very, very much just bullet points of, of what can be spoken about from, from nearly every book on the shelf if a person learns to read properly. Any book in the world, any song in the world, because like our sages tell us, the human being themselves is the greatest commentary on the Torah. Our own experiences, our yearning, our craving, our deficiency, our desire for something that we can't even name even when we have what we need, that, that's what we know to be true. When a person looks at Kabbalah, let's say, and it's a fancy word, it's an exciting word, it's a, a monetized word, right? Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. So when a person looks at the writings of the Arizal, Rav Yitzchak Luria, uh, not the first, but one of the most significant contributors to the development of what we refer to as the inner teachings of Torah. Typically speaking, uh, the way I've received it from my teachers is that there's basically a five-stage process through which the inner teachings of the Torah or Judaism or Kabbalah have developed. There was Moshe Rabbeinu, who received everything that could possibly be received. That was given over 
on the spiritual level to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the sage who's, whose passing we celebrated recently. Then there was the Arizal, of Isaac Luria. Then there was the Baal Shem Tov, the holy Baal Shem Tov. And then my bias is that the fifth and final kind of iteration, final is questionable, was, was Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And when you look at these teachings, what, what you come to find is that it is nowhere nearly what you would expect to find in some idealistic mystical program. Right? It's not talking about lights. It's not talking about utopian experience. It's not talking about fantastical flights of experience into the blissful nature of self-forgetting. It's really none of that. When you look at how God creates the world, you would expect to find some arranged and orderly perception. But the first thing we encounter is the notion of tzimtzum contraction, removal of the infinite light, an act of pulling away, an act of retreat, a traumatic withdrawal of that which was present. And what does it result in? A void, a halal, an abyss, an empty space that appears to be devoid entirely of the animating divine light, which in truth saturates every fiber of it. So that's the first thing we encounter is this emptiness, this this removal of fullness and this experience and birth of emptiness. And then there's hope. And then there's a desire to draw down residual lights of godliness. And as expressed in the infinite ray of that infinite light that was contracted and removed to the sides. And then you expect, okay, so hopefully things will go well right now. And then suddenly we encounter another cataclysmic trauma, the Shvira Takelim, the shattering of the vessels. There was meant to be a, a balanced relationship between lights, which represents the ineffable transcendent concept of spirituality, and kalim vessels, which are meant to be our human and worldly creations that hold that light. And something went wrong. A lot of things went wrong, and they shattered into a million pieces. And it's the residual after effects, the post-traumatic disorder of that experience is what creates our reality. It's the total opposite of what a person would expect to find in an idealistic system. But the truth of the matter is that this is idealism, to look at the world as it is and to say, Hashem, this is how you created it. Why? <laughs> if we start asking why, we have an infinite amount of questions to ask. That's not, we're asking what? We're asking, what do we need to do now? The why we can speculate from here until tomorrow. Thankfully, we have our teachers and our masters who give enough of a reason. You can find, I, I promise you, I promise you, as someone who has spent a lot of time studying a lot of philosophy, a lot of postmodern philosophy, a lot of continental philosophy, a lot of poetry, a lot of psychoanalysis. There is nothing that cannot be found within our tradition. Absolutely nothing. Not one nuance, not one experience, not one spiritual value. There is nothing that can be found in the East that can't be found in our tradition. Some of the techniques, you know, if a person merits, they spent some time in the East and they learned how to do it so they can come back to, you know, our tradition with renewed vigor. But we could also learn there's traditions, there's breathing, there's all of this. Our tzaddikim teach us very clearly, the goal is not to run away from this world and retreat into perfection. The goal is to draw the light of Hashem's perfection into our imperfect vessels. And that's when we can become perfectly imperfect. There was nobody like this but David Amelech, King David, who our sages tell us love to walk around the boundaries of hell. Whatever that means, we all know what it means. We all know what it means to walk around the boundaries of hell in our own lives, to perseverate on negativity, to be stuck in fear and anxiety and discomfort and pressure and, and being pushed away from where we would like to be living with this almost per, perpetual sense of FOMO, right? We all know what it means to, to walk along the boundaries of hell. But David Amelech loved to walk there because that's where he served God the best. When you look at the book of Psalms, what King David gave us was his heart and soul. He gave his inner struggle to us. He gave us what it means to be a human being who recognizes that I have absolutely nothing of my own. Everything is divine grace. Everything, every moment, every breath, every experience, every moment of consciousness or phenomenological awareness is a gift that beckons us to either find God in that moment or, or find a void in that moment. King David, we're told, walked around barefoot, right? As if you were at a Grateful Dead concert or a Fish concert. There's a reason the Jews love jam music. 
right? They love the undecidability of it. They love the open-ended of it, open-endedness of it, the wandering, the meandering, the recognition that on my own, I can't make any beautiful music, but when I attach myself to others, that's where the beauty of music comes from. David Melech liked to walk around barefoot to remind himself that in this world, sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. And again, I want to make very, very clear, this is not about some sort of gratuitous romantization of pain, God forbid. That's not what this is about. Pleasure is the ultimate goal, but pleasure doesn't mean perfection. Pleasure means living with a sense of perfection in imperfection. That's what joy is. Joy is the willingness to see all things as shining, even though everything looks dark. To find fullness in spite of the fact that things are broken, because it's the brokenness that gives birth to my wholeness. When we're able to acknowledge that, when we're able to be macabre that, when we're able to own our experiences in that way, we come to serve Hashem with our own hearts, not somebody else's, not some jealousy-driven attempt to be of a higher spiritual value, but rather to really sit confidently in myself with all of my brokenness and all of my strengths and to accept myself and to find God in that moment as well. And so when we're able to learn the, the rightful place of chisaron, of lack, of deficiency and the, the birth of desire that emerges from there, not a desire that needs to be satisfied, but a desire that survives all attempts at satisfaction. It's good to be thirsty. It's good to continue feeling that something is not present. When a person looks at the potentially the, the most popular, famous, westernized depiction of the relationship between the human being and the divine, we could say that it's the Sistine Chapel. And when a person looks at the center of the Sistine Chapel, from afar, what it appears to be is the anthropomorphized kind of depiction of a human god reaching his hand out and the hand of man attempting to touch that hand. And from a distance, it looks like those hands have touched. But if you zoom in on the center of the picture, what you realize is that there's a gap between those two fingers. And that gap is the birthplace of craving and desire. And it's also the birthplace of self-acceptance. It's where we learn to accept ourselves unconditionally, unconditional positive self-regard. I'm broken and that's okay. I'm broken because I'm a human being, not because I'm not good enough, not because I've done something wrong, but because I'm paying attention. The Kutzker Rebbe famously says that there is nothing more whole than a broken heart. There's nothing more whole than a broken heart. But the inverse is also true. There's nothing more broken than a whole heart. Someone who thinks that they have everything in the world, someone who thinks that I don't need anything, there's not much to say to that person. There's not much spiritual growth that can take place there. Uh, to, end with a, to end with a teaching that I realized that I, that I skipped before. So the Gemara says that an intoxicated person is not able to pray. So why is that? The Gemara says, because when somebody is intoxicated, the entire world appears to them as a straight plane. And that's simply the opposite of prayer. Prayer is born out of deficiency. It's contingent on on the recognition of my lack. When I know that I am in dire straits and I hit that existential crisis within the self that says that I can't anymore. Or as our grandparents said in Yiddish, ich kann nicht sein, I cannot. It's at that point that a person transforms themselves to a seat for the Shekhinah, to the seat for God's presence. So an intoxicated person, someone who feels that everything is okay, someone who feels that everything is perfect, prayer is an impossibility because there's fullness. So prayer is born out of this encounter with our deficiency. To end, I want to quote you know, one of my favorite... Uh, psychoanalyst. He wasn't Jewish. His name was Donald Winnicott. Started off as a, a pediatrician, and then eventually he started studying the behavior of children, and he became a psychoanalyst. Very beautiful books called Playing and Reality. Just incredibly, incredibly beautiful, beautiful ideas. But there's a, a short essay that Donald Winnicott wrote called The Clinical Fear of Breakdown. And Winnicott writes as follows, and this must have been in the 70s, where he says that more often than not, when a client comes into my room, what they're experiencing is some deep discomfort over the anticipation of some unknown breakdown. That something frightening, nameless, overwhelming sits right beyond the corner of my conscious awareness and its impending presence in my life causes me to assume the worst. And Winnicott basically says, basically describing anxiety. 
And Winnicott says that sometimes the only thing I can do for my client is to sit them down and say, don't worry so much, it already happened. The breakdown already happened. It's already broken. Our job now is to learn how to live with the brokenness until the only true wholeness in the world, the shlemus, the homine shlemus, the wholeness in all manners of perfection, until God decides to reveal the latent perfection that exists within our soul, but will always be yearning. Even when Mashiach comes, even when things are revealed to be perfect, they're still imperfect at the same moment because we're never quite as perfect as God. And therefore there will always be an infinite gap that separates us between the infinite, which propels the undying desire of the neshama in this world. I hope that this was a somewhat coherent, you know, and, and, and Bezra Sashem, you know, there's a, this is something I speak about a lot. So if anybody's interested, I'm sure Abdaniel can, uh, can share some, some further information about that. But, um, but Ashrechem, Ashrechem, praiseworthy are you for spending your time doing this in a time that's so scary and strange. In so many different ways a person can spend their time. Ashrecha Mamish, praiseworthy are you that you choose to spend your day trying to, to cultivate an appreciation of what our tradition has to offer. And, and the ultimate goal is to bring the glory back to God and, and draw more light of infinitude into our broken vessels. And uh, wish you and enjoy. Thank you so much. That was stunning. Um, I, uh, I want to ask one question, which is, all the Hasidim we see from the ones that I've read about, it seems like almost that thirst, I don't want to say for perfection. I think they, they value the Avoda in and of itself. Um, uh, do you notice that? Do you notice the accept? You don't get that vibe from a lot of the Hasidim and the, and the Rebbe's that they were content with the imperfection, or is it a superficial way that I'm looking at that there's a contentment with it. That's acceptance. That's that's Kabbalah Atzmit. It's the it's the almost impossible paradox of of lack and and sufficiency at once. They're satisfied in their desire. Mm, mm. And, and would you say that Moshe Rabbeinu, God says you cannot see me and live. That the sh the fiftieth gate wasn't. It, he he was the most perfected individual. But the Torah is teaching us that there's still always going to be a place. Specifically him. That's what the Leshem says. Uh, the Leshem says that the reason that Moshe Rabbeinu was the one who was told that perfection is not a possibility is because he was the most perfect of all human beings. And even him, to teach us that it's not dependent, it's not totally in some pathological symptom of human deficiency, but rather it's the very nature of what it means to be human. That the language of the Leshem is that it's a law within creation that a human being simply cannot be perfect. I love that. Um, where Liel asks, where can we reach you? What's a good place to find you? So I have a, I have a, a big presence, uh, not a big presence. I spend time on, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, I also have a, uh, a YouTube channel and a, and a podcast called Inward with, uh, with Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld. Um, so any of that, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to give, uh, happy to give my email address, Reb Daniel, if anybody wants to, uh, to reach out about something. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Say there. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, sure. The name of the Winnicott book is um, is playing in reality, but the essay, I don't see the end of this question. The essay is called Clinical Fear of Breakdown. Clinical Fear of Breakdown. And, and Liel wants to know what's one of the greatest books you've read. <laughs> That's quite a question. I would say that Man's Search for Meaning from Viktor Frankl is up there. Beautiful. Also, um, uh, Where the Wild Things Are and Alexander... And the no good, very bad, horrible day. And here I thought it would be the Leshem or something. It, 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 you can find that wisdom in the. Oh, uh, yeah, no. I mean, yeah, the Leshem, Rabbi Nachman, but uh, those are the, where the wild things are until you cry. I okay. It. I love it. Thank you, Rav. A lot of health and success. Thank you for all that you're doing Thank in the world. You. Thank you. All right, you all. See you all soon.